to start the afternoon session of, of our meeting. Um, Leonardo, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Hi, hi, hi Leonardo, and hi, colleagues. I think that's Estefania, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> hi, nice to meet you. So let me have a look at the participants. Maybe we give them like uh, two minutes more to connect because it's uh, two o'clock now. So mm -hmm. we give them a few more minutes and then we, we start. Excellent. Uh, mm -hmm. Lucrecia, uh, I wanted to ask you something. So um, can we share the presentation from our computer? Because we made some small adjustments. Sure, sure. The only thing I would like to ask you um, afterwards is to please send us the updated presentation. Uh, yes. We will upload it on the, on the web page. Okay. Okay, thank you. So two more minutes and then we start. Okay. Okay, I think we can uh, start. So, dear participants, now we have a very interesting session on equipment installation use and maintenance, so good practices, uh, given by Ms. Stefania Perez Fernandez, Ms. Jessica Loliver, and Mr. Leonardo Ramirez Lopez from Buki Labor Technique, uh, Switzerland. So, Leonardo and colleagues, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Lucrezia. So can you allow me to share my screen, please? Uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Yeah. Yeah, you should be able to share it now. Yeah. Is this one? No, is this one? I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. So does everyone see my screen now? Yes. Yes, oh. you can see your screen. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting us to, to this uh, uh, meeting and also to, to present this, uh, um, uh, this, yeah, this, our experiences, basically with the uh, equipment installation, the use and the maintenance of uh, general laboratory devices. Um, one second. Okay, so uh, today uh, with me is Estefania Fernandez Perez, as uh, Lucrecia already mentioned. Uh, just I, I give you a little bit of um, introduction to myself. I'm a soil scientist by training. Um, I have been working basically with uh, with um, in soil science over the past uh, fifteen years. Um, my, my core expertise is in the NIR spectroscopy and in data analytics. I'm the data analytics manager within the company. 
And yeah, Estefania. Hi, um, I am well, Estefania Perez and I'm a biologist by training, but uh, through my PhD, I got into the NIR world as well. And so my specialty is NIR chemometrics. And I have also worked and applied this technique to, to soil uh, analysis. So we're basically specialized in NIR mainly, but yeah, uh, yeah. with ample experience on application on soils. Yeah, so, um, so we, or, as I said, uh, our core expertise is in the, in the um, near infrared spectroscopy devices or infrared spectroscopy devices. Although here in, within the company, we have also gained some experience with, um, with other type of devices and also with the installation of, uh, general installation of uh, devices for, for, for different types of uh, laboratories around the, the globe, okay? So, so we have, well, the company is quite, has a quite um, wide experience, is present in different countries around the world, as I said, which I think that it is really important to gain experience about the good practices when it comes to the installation of, uh, of instruments. Uh, we have, I mean, we, we interact on a daily basis with, uh, with a lot of um, users and we have noticed that there are some, let's say, um, common pitfalls that are, that I, we believe that are really use, uh, easy to account for. Um, but if they, if they are not really correct or if they are not really account for, they, have, they might have a really big impact in the, um, in the results or, or in the quality of the results that your laboratory delivers. So, <clears throat> We have um, or the company here, here we built a lot of different devices and they are, they will be, uh, they are listed here in this, in the presentation and also some devices that are really uh, relevant to the, to the soil laboratory analysis are listed here. Although we said, well, we were thinking with Estefania, okay, how do we, um, where, where to focus for this presentation? We thought, that we should focus on those complex devices. So for example, um, atomic absorption spectroscopy, which is not really, um, or which is, yeah, which is, let's say, really a, a common uh, device in soil, in soil laboratories. We are not going to focus on those tiny devices like the potentiometers, because I think that, um, that the, the, the manuals in the manuals we can we can easily see how they operate how to how to maintain them and th those are not really complex we have we the, the devices that we are going to talk about today are listed here the nitrogen determination by Kjeldal analysis the elemental analyzer for carbon and nitrogen and uh, potentially sulfur atomic absorption spectrometer which is which is, as I said is really important for um, uh, determination or like assessing nutrients in the soil. And of course, uh, NIR spectroscopy and infrared spectroscopy in general. We know that <clears throat> those are not uh, really like typical devices in, in soil labs, but um, we see that in the near future, those devices will be uh, present uh, or will, will be really useful in, in laboratories. Okay, not not to perhaps not to replace uh, um, current technology or uh, standard technology, but they will be present there to support the analysis or the analytical the, the standard analytical methods, and we will see that later in the in the in the upcoming slides. Okay, so <clears throat> with those with those devices, what do we cover then? So um, if we talk about Kjeldal, then we mean basically nitrogen total nitrogen in soils. If we talk about atomic absorption spectrometer, then we, we are covering basically um, exchange, exchangeable bases and also exchangeable acidity, uh, manganese, uh, iron as well, and other elements that we will see later. So when we talk about uh, DUMAS or elemental analyzers, then we talk about carbon mainly, also nitrogen, and in some cases, sulfur. And 
finally, when we talk about NIR spectroscopy or NIR spectrometers, we, um, we talk about carbon, the analysis of carbon, the determination of or the prediction of nitrogen, the exchangeable bases, the, the, the pH, the, um, the um, texture of the soil. And with mid infrared spectrometers, we can basically de assess, again, exchangeable bases, exchangeable uh, acidity, uh, carbon, nitrogen, pH, and a very wide range of, uh, of properties. So before we jump directly into the devices themselves, we wanted to give you some like very, very uh, basic recommendations that we think that they apply to all devices, okay? For installation, especially. So the first one, I'd say the first rule I will say is that the equipment should be always be installed by a specialist from the company. You purchase the instrument. Okay, so you, you have, if you, if you buy an atomic absorption spectrometer, you are definitely entitled to ask for a specialist to come to your laboratory and install it. Okay, um, so if any of your equipment is used in a manner not specified by the manufacturer, then the protection provided uh, by, the, by the manufacturer might be, in, might be impaired. So that's why I say that it is really important that a specialist from the company comes to your place and do the installation so that basically you are, um, let's say, carefree about, the, um, about, uh, about damages in the instrument or um, breaking the, 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 the warranty and, and so on. And also the, the, the advantage of having a, a specialist from the company or from, from the provider is that he will be able to answer all your questions when you, for the first time, uh, let's say, open and operate the, 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 the instrument. So you get a kind of um, um, customized training for yourself. So take advantage of that, okay? And the other thing is that it is also really important is that <clears throat> try not to leave the instruments there lying in your lab for a, for, for, for a long period of time. I think that if you buy an instrument today, then try to start using it or try to install it as soon as possible. Because the, 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 um, the earliest, then the, 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 the easier it will be for you to get support from the company you purchase where you are going to, to get the instrument. Um, <clears throat> another important thing is that, um, yeah, we have seen that it's better when the, when the, when the, when the users, they ask, in advance for a list um, of uh, what they need to have. I mean, what are the requirements that they need to the, for pre, pri, uh, prior to the installation? So where they need, uh, if you need computers, you need to, you need to purchase them in advance. You, the power plugs, for example, that sounds like ridiculous to think about power plugs, but this is really important to take into account. Sometimes, the installation of an instrument may be uh, um, blocked by just a simple power plug because perhaps the laboratory is not in a it, it, or the laboratory is in a very remote place and it is difficult to get the proper plug. So please ask the the, 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 the checklist from the provider of the instruments so that you make sure that everything will run smoothly during the installation. And also check about the environment. The environment that you need to install your, um, for which you need to install the, uh, in which you need or uh, to install the, the device. Sometimes um, air conditioning systems are required in, the, in those rooms where you are planning to, to install the instrument. So check for all those kind of things. And I think that the best, the best way to, to get a proper lease is not do it by yourself, but as the, the, the provider, okay? Um, Another thing that is also important is when 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 you um, get the instrument, when you get it installed, then you can also ask the the, the specialist to get to create a kind of uh, with you a routine maintenance schedule with a list of check uh, tasks that uh, for each device that you have, or well for the device that perhaps you use uh, for which the specialist is there. And um, if, if you plan to do all the maintenance by yourself, 
it is highly recommended to attend training courses provided by the device supplier. When the instruments are really complex, the, the supplier, they usually, uh, they offer training. So please try to attend those trainings, or perhaps now, now with this coronavirus situation, um, uh, webinars have become more available. So check the, 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 the websites of the, of, the, of the suppliers for webinars so that you can basically get proper training for operating your instrument. Peripherals, I think that it is also really important. This is in hand with what I said before with the checklist of what you need um, uh, for the installation of the instrument. So make sure that all the peripherals that you are going to get for the installation are, are actually compatible with the instrument that you are going to receive. So um, another thing that sounds like obvious is that um, the on off buttons must be always in the off position before the connect before connecting to the power supply always always especially in those cases where the um, where the power the, the the electricity is not so so stable so those are kind of the the basic rules for the that we can identify that are common to let's say all of the complex instruments so um, now I um, I want to give the the the, 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 the here the, the microphone to to Stefania. She's going to talk about Kjeldal for nitrogen determination. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, so Kjeldal is one of these uh, main techniques that we decided would be relevant to talk about, and we all know that nitrogen determination is quite relevant. So um, let me see. Yeah. I'll start explaining briefly the, the process. Um, the Keldal process uh, consists of um, three main steps. Uh, the, the, the procedure is, uh, is la like a mineralization of organic material in, in a boiling mixture of sulfuric acid and sulfate salts at boiling temperatures, 420 uh, degrees Celsius. Um, there is a digestion process uh, in which the organi organically bonded nitrogen is converted into ammonium sulfate. Uh, the next step would be the alkalinization and distillation. Uh, during this step, the, um, the ammonia is liberated and then is steam distilled uh, and ready for the next step, which would be a titration. To, determine, to finally determine the, um, the amount of nitrogen uh, in, in, the, in the final solution. Um, this is a classical setup for, for Kjeldal, uh, where we have the flask, uh, where the digestion occurs. Uh, then we have um, another flask uh, where the um, alkalinization and distillation happens and the final stage for titration. Uh, thankfully, <laughs> there are automated systems for uh, Kjeldal analysis, which allow uh, the sampling of up to 20 samples. So the previously it was one by one, now it's a, an automated system. Uh, um, here I'm showing uh, one of the devices manufactured by the company, just because I had the pictures handy. <laughs> but this would be the same for, for any, any device. Um, we have several units for each of these steps. First, we have the, the digestion um, unit um, in which the up to 20 samples are digested. Uh, we, we see here on the left side, this blue uh, part, this is called a uh, scrubber. Um, this is, is quite important because during the digestion, um, toxic fumes are produced. So this, uh, this device, the scrubber, uh, collects and neutralizes these uh, toxic fumes. Uh, the second unit is the auto sampler. It actually goes together with the, with the, with the other unit, the alkalinization and distillation. But the auto sampler basically uh, contains the sample tubes, as I said, up to 20, and automatically uh, like with a mechanic arm, it samples each tube and transfers the solutions uh, to the to the alkalinization and distillation unit. 
uh, the third, in the third unit. Again, alkalinization and distillation happens. And finally, uh, we have the titration unit with a burette, et cetera. pH, uh, well, the, the titration could be colorimetric or potentiometric, usually it's potentiometric. And well, yeah, we also have a touchpad, but this of course depends on, on each device. It's not mandatory, I guess. Um, I have here a slide in which I, I leave you a link in case you want to see this process in, in, in action. Uh, it's, a, it's a YouTube video. I mean, it's accessible to anyone. Of course, I've been talking about sulfuric acid and like strong chemicals. So this is a, the nature of this process uh, makes really important that we talk about health and safety. And uh, I, I have listed here like the main health and safety aspects I think that have to be taken into account are like the high temperatures, for example, this digestion happens at a really high temperature. Toxic fumes uh, produced by digestion. Uh, so the use and manipulation of acid and basic uh, reagents, which can cause uh, skin burns. You could drop the tubes, the glass. Broken glass can you know, it can happen. Uh, it's unlikely, but electricity uh, it's also a risk we should take into account, of course. So uh, of course. Good practices. I mean, this is applicable to any laboratory, really. But uh, I think it's necessary always to remember to wear pr protective goggles, uh, gloves, lab coats, and the instruments are heavy. The the units are heavy, so it's always recommended that um, that you lift them with with the help of someone else. Um, Talking about the installation, it's also necessary that we take into account these health and safety measures. So, for example, I was talking about toxic fumes, so it's quite important that you place the device in a fume hood uh, for, for the extraction of these gases. Um, you need to have a stable, uh, clean, level surface, clear also, not have a lot of stuff around or containers or other chemicals that could flame because of the high temperatures. Um, so, yeah, and also, well, this is obvious, but you have to make sure that you have the main switches and plugs and taps and everything you need accessible at all times and not have interference of cables here and there. Uh, also, the, the setup is, is important for the, for the health and safety and the, for the correct operation of, of the device. Uh, the, for example, the digestion unit doesn't need to be placed next to the auto sampler and the alkalinization unit, but, uh, but the digestion unit should always be next to the scrubber because the scrubber uh, will be more efficient at extracting the, the fumes from the digestion. Uh, then. For example, the, the auto sampler should be next to the to the distillation, but that's just because the mechanical arm is designed to, to work like that. But this, these are uh, things that also, they seem simple, but when you receive your device, you don't know, like, how much space do I need? Should I put this here? Should I put it there? So it's important to, to always know uh, how much space you're going to require and, and what you're going to require, for example, what connections, like electrical connections, uh, data connection between the different parts of the system, um, reagent or, or water or waste connections. Um, it's important to have a storage tank and also level sensors that will tell you when the, when the tank is filling up and you need to empty uh, the waste uh, tank, etc. And of course, we, we talked about peripheral devices already, but not only a computer, but also like a balance or a printer or a barcode reader. You, you also need to take into account this kind of thing. Usually, as we recommended already, installation should be ideally done by a person, like a specialist from the 
from the vendor company. So this should be uh, taken into account by this person. However, it's good if you in advance are aware of all the all the things you need, so so you know that you have the space, etc. Um, maintenance, well, maintenance of Kieldal devices, well, it's not so complex. Uh, I have some general recommendations here, and the first one is that the maintenance and repairs should be carried out by trained personnel uh, and also with the with the right tools. Um, I guess you can also have like a, I mean, it's up to everybody, but like you could have regular servicing from, from the company. But if you, if you need to do more routine maintenance daily or weekly, then um, it's recommended that you get proper training from the service or a specialist person of the company. Obvious, obvious recommendations, well, switch off the power supply, remove uh, like uh, sources of flammable vapor, let the, the instrument cool down. And uh, this is sometimes this we don't realize, but we, we go and touch it and it's still hot. So, um, so this is important to, to keep in mind. Um, yeah, and always wear the protective, protective equipment, etc. that has already been mentioned. Um, some maintenance, as I was saying, so you could maybe do daily or weekly maintenance, so you don't need the service person of the uh, company, but so what involves the daily maintenance of this device? Uh, cleaning and calibrate, calibrating the pH electrode. If the, if the titration is potentiometric, then you, you will have a pH probe which you can clean and, and calibrate using buffer solutions. Um, also uh, refilling boric acid uh, for the step uh, between distillation and titration. Clean the, the sample, sam sample tubes, etc. cetera, um, between uses. Um, Clean, uh, like weekly, it's recommended that you clean, clean, do like a general cleaning, like uh, clean the housing, clean the titrator, the, the deep tube of the sampler, which is the, the tube that goes sample by sample, uh, transferring the, the solutions into the distillation unit. <coughs> Sorry, cleaning the colorimetric sensor if the titration is colorimetric. Monthly, monthly, you can calibrate the pump, um, inspect the um, smaller bits, you know, like the burette of the titrator, uh, the sample tubes again, the, the amount of distillate. Uh, every like couple of times a year um, is, is recommended that you check the sealing of tubes and pipes just to, pre to prevent any, liquid, uh, any leaks. Um, replacing the splash protector, this is something that I forgot to mention, but all these units have like a, a protector, a splash protector that prevent all these strong chemicals to, to splash onto the user uh, in case there is some leaks or something. Uh, so sometimes if there is some, some splash, then the protector could be damaged. So you may want to, to replace it like a uh, couple of times a year, but uh, it's not <coughs> so likely that you will need to replace it so often. But. And yeah, every yeah every six months is recommended to replace the pH probe. Um, yeah, finally yearly, uh, well, if some parts are worn or yeah, um, the pump is damaged or something like this, then you may need replacement or for the um, distillation, the steam generator sometimes uh, gets calcified. So maybe some decalcification might be needed every year, but I guess it depends on the water hardness of each place. <laughs> so um, that was uh, like a brief description and some suggestions of uh, Kildan analysis, but um, Oh, some some lines appear here. 
Um, I'm mm. <laughs> handing over to Leo to, to talk about the um, <coughs> elemental analyzers for soil and uh, for carbon and nitrogen. So, um, Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, okay, uh, I'm going to talk about the elemental analyzers for soil carbon and total carbon and nitrogen, total nitrogen as well. So, uh, in the instrument that we, uh, in the Kielder instrument that we saw before, uh, uh, we only analyze total carbon with the elemental analyzers. We have the possibility to analyze carbon, uh, total carbon and total nitrogen, as well as in some cases, uh, other elements like um, sulfur. So <clears throat> the basic, basic principle here is that you weight your sample. So you have your soil sample, you weight this sample, then you, you usually press this sample and in most of the instruments, it is recommended that the sample is pressed, the, your soil sample is pressed. And then the instrument, what it does, but once the sample is there, the instrument burns out this sample at very, very high temperatures, like 1000 degrees around Celsius, uh, 1000 degrees Celsius. Of course, with the, this is a combustion that is, um, that is along with the, with the uh, oxygen. So <clears throat> in some cases, this, this, uh, these temperatures might reach up to 2,000 uh, um, uh, degrees Celsius. So, <clears throat> and then at the end, what, it, what the instrument does when this, once the sample is burned, so once the sample is burned, what it does is that it liberates some gases, okay? And those gases are captured by the instrument. And this is what it is analyzed, basically. What is inside those gases? So how much carbon do we have in there? How much uh, nitrogen do we have in there? So this is the principle on, of, of operation of those elemental analyzers. So, and this is, a, this is an example of, or a picture of a, a, a conventional uh, elemental analyzer. So here you have the auto sampler, which is really good. I mean, uh, usually those instruments, they come with, um, to, um, with an auto sampler that allows you to put around 20 samples, 40 samples. It depends on the, on the, on the supplier, but yeah, the auto sample is really, really convenient. So it comes also, of course, with the furnace that is in charge of basically burning out the, the sample being analyzed. It has some tubes. I'm gonna explain what is the functionality of those tubes later and how to maintain them. And also, <clears throat> Here you have, you see that there is a con, uh, thermoconductivity sensor um, or, yeah, or detector. Basically what it does is that it translates that information about the gases. So it basically detects some signals about the gases and converts those signals into meaningful information like uh, carbon, total carbon and total nitrogen. <clears throat> Remember that um, a couple of slides ago, I talked about uh, pressing the sample. So <clears throat> the samples are usually pressed like this. So you, you take a, a thin foil and then you, you press the sample so that they uh, resemble a, a peel, okay? And then those peels are uh, put in the auto sampler here. So you can analyze, as I said, up to, uh, in this case, up to 60 samples. So this is really, really convenient if you, uh, for the high throughput. Uh, um, this is, uh, I'm going to explain now with a little bit of, of more detail how much exactly it works. So you have, I, I'm going to start from the right and then I will move towards the left of this slide. So here we have the auto sampler. You, you put your tiny samples there. Then the samples are um, uh, transported by a bowl bulb and then they go to this ash uh, finger here and well, well in the ash finger of course they are uh, they are uh, burned out then they are they they, they, they pass through the post-combustion basically 
which is kind of in charge of uh, re, uh, burned out the remains of the of the sample. So once you you, you the, the samples are burned, what you get, what you try to capture is all the gases um, that are uh, as, as, that are re resulting from that burning process. So those gases are they come with um, with um, moisture. I mean, with water vapor. So what you, what the system does is that it needs to remove all this water vapor from the from the gas from the from the from the yeah from the gas. And those tubes that you see here, they are in charge of doing that. Once the gas basically is free of moisture, then the gas is passed through the detector. Okay. Um, okay, sorry. Before before that, it goes to the reductor. <laughs> the reductor, what it is, what it is in charge is of doing is that it converts all the the different components containing carbon into CO two, and also all the components containing N uh, nitrogen into N two. And once this is done, they finally go through the detector to the detection um, system. In this, detect, in this detection system is um, basically there you have a sensor that it detects the amount of CO2 and the amount of nitrogen in, in the gas. And this is how you can basically um, uh, uh, quantify total carbon and total nitrogen. Does anyone um, Okay, so this is a, this is a, this is an art, um, um, drawing basically of how it works. Basically, you have the sample, it is burned, and it goes here, then it is uh, dried out, then it passes through the reduction process. In the reduction, in the reduction process, what you convert is basically everything that has carbon into CO2 and everything that has nitrogen into N2. And then it is um, uh, this thermal conductivity detector is in charge of basically uh, measuring what it measures is the thermal conductivity of the gas. And then it compares this thermal conductivity of this resulting gas against the thermal conductivity of a gas, which can be helium. And then based on that, basically based on the amount of N2 or, or, or CO2 or N2, basically, the, um, <clears throat> the, the, the thermal conductivity varies. So you can relate thermal conductivity to the amount of nitrogen that you have in your sample. So this is uh, what you get basically is something like this. At the, uh, at the bottom of this slide, you see that there is a kind of a spectrum. And this is a spectrum of thermal conductivity compared to the thermal conductivity of the um, helium. And based on that peak that you see there of thermal conductivity, you can quantify nitrogen. This is really good because it, it only takes like around four minutes per analysis. So, and the way in which it is quantified, it is basically, you put that peak into a mathematical function. So basically you compute the area, uh, the, the peak area and relate this peak area to, um, to the content of nitrogen or carbon in some of the, of the samples that you have. Basically, if you have um, calibration standards, the, you, you, you can do that job of converting peak area into nitrogen or carbon. So as I said, the, the, the advantage of this is that it has a really, really high uh, throughput. Basically in, in nine hours, you can analyze around 120 samples because the, the analysis uh, per sample, it takes between four and six minutes. So, um, you basically, if you can, pre if you prepare all your samples and if you put them all in your in your device, then you can leave them running through the night, and the next day you come and everything is ready. But of course, we were talking about <clears throat> really high temperatures, like around 1,000 degrees Celsius. So, <laughs> yeah, you have to you have to ask yourself basically whether it is a good idea to leave this instrument running through the night if the conditions of your lab, um, basically you have to ask yourself based on the conditions of, of, of your lab. I have seen, or actually I have, I, I myself, I have, 
I have done that already, that I have left uh, samples running overnight with the, with this um, with this um, instrument. But um, but yeah, you have to take into consideration a lot of stuff so that you don't put your lab at risk. Okay. Um, so it is better if perhaps you analyze the samples in the morning and then while they are being analyzed, you do something else so that you, cap, you can keep an eye on that instrument. Okay, and they, also on the surroundings of the instrument because the, the, the surrounding elements um, can also get some um, heat due to the, 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 the operation of the instrument. So um, for the installation, <clears throat> what you need to consider is it is highly recommended that you have an air conditioned room. As I said, again, going back to the problem of, of high temperatures, you need to make sure that the, that the room, the temperature inside the room is always stable. So it needs to be dry and very well ventilated. Um, and of course, you need, to, you, need, you need to take care of the surroundings. So you cannot just place it in a place where, where it might get even uh, where it, it can increase the, let's say, the temperatures and so on. So the carrier gas, usually we have to work with helium. Okay, and in some cases it can be also CO2, uh, but in, but <clears throat> yeah, but basically it depends. If you are analyzing only nitrogen, then you can use uh, CO2 as the carrier gas. But usually uh, it is highly recommended to use helium uh, with a purity of 99.99%. So it has to be really, really pure so that you make sure that nothing from that gas that you use as the carrier gas ends up in, the, in, the, in your analysis results. So yeah, pay attention to the supplier of the gas, pay attention of the guarantee of the purity of the gas, and also for the combustion, when you, uh, if you use uh, oxygen, you have also to pay attention to the purity of the, ice, uh, the uh, um, oxygen that you are using. You, I recommend that you always Ask for the guarantee, or like, 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 uh, how can I say? It's not, not, not the guarantee, but, um, but um, at least that the, the supplier can guarantee somehow that the purity is what it is stated in their, in the in the label of the of the of the of the pipes that you are getting. Reagents. So um, reagents might vary a lot. Also, I, I recommend that you check from the instrument vendor or in the manual, what reagents you are um, allowed to use. If you are going to deviate a little bit, or if you want to change some of those reagents by some others, because it actually, for in, in, in your case, make really sense to, to use a different type of reagents that are not specified in the, in the manual, I totally recommend that you go to, um, to the vendor and ask him, hey, can we use that um, reagent Yes, no, and why? And perhaps try to come up. If 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 it is not possible, try to come up with a with a with a with a with a workaround or a solution that um, allows you to basically to do the 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 the, the, the task that you, you you were planning to do uh, with those you know, reag uh, oil reagents. So calibration standards. I think we haven't talked uh, much about that uh, so far, but I think that calibration standards are really really important. So. Um, why? Because they they are, I'll say they are responsible of the quality of the results that you deliver as well. So try to make sure that the the supplier of those standards is always the same supplier, and that this supplier is is um, that you can guarantee an, um, a supply from uh, of calibration standards from the same supplier over time. Okay. Try not to move from one supplier to the other, because this might affect also the, 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 the results that you are getting in your lab. So try to keep the calibration, the, the, the calibration standard supplier as constant as possible. Okay, and again, in some cases, this, this, these standards are not supplier by the, by the manufacturer. So you have to do this task by yourself and call and try to compare different standards. Perhaps try to call your your your, your colleagues in our labs 
or in other countries and see what kind of standards they are actually they are using. So it is um, also highly recommended that the installation, uh, the first startup of the instrument is done by a trained service technician again. Okay. So because mo most uh, manufacturers ex explicitly indicate this as a mandatory requirement. Otherwise, you might lose the warranty of your instrument. So be careful with that because uh, if you lose the warranty, then <clears throat> and if the instrument has a problem later, six months later or three months later, then you will not be entitled to get um, a, a, a proper proper support from the manufacturer. And you might incur in like um, high uh, costs. Um, uh, for the maintenance of these elemental analyzers, uh, we have to take into account a couple of, like, let's say, a couple of things. Um, there, remember that I show you some tubes, and those tubes they have some fillings that they need to be replaced um, regularly. So here, for example, in the tubes that I'm showing in these slides, or in this slide, sorry, the tubes, the, the pictures. Uh, of the tubes on the left here, they show tubes that are already consumed. Those tubes are uh, used to dry out uh, the gas, basically to remove all the moisture from the gas that you have in your system. But you can do this, uh, you, can, you can throw away that um, filling and remove and, and fill the tubes again with a new filling. Okay, the filling needs to be the same as, as the one specified by the manufacturer. So the maintenance of these tubes, you have to do it basically around every 800 samples um, for the drying tube, for, for, for the small one, and around for, uh, 100 samples for the, for the large um, tube. So you have to constantly really refill those tubes because the samples, of course, they 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 trap a lot of, uh, of of this moisture, and it is really important for your analysis, for the quality of your analysis, that you keep a really good eye on this. And um, this means, so if if we are talking about hundred samples or eight hundred samples, and if if we are talking also about that the instrument can do around 100 or 120 samples per day. If you are doing such amount of samples per day, it means that you have to refill these uh, tubes basically every day. So pay attention to, to, to that, please. Um, <clears throat> the, other, the other things that you also have to keep an eye are the, um, basically the, the, the combustion tube. So where the combustion of the sample happens and also the reduction tube where the separation or basically where, where all the carbon and nitrogen are converted into or are put together into CO2 and O2. So be careful with those tubes. They are usually super hot. I mean, they, they, it takes, takes a while until they are really cooled down. So if you have used your instrument and if you are planning to do some maintenance on it right after it is used, then take your time, leave the instrument cool down and then do the maintenance. But always, just for, for, for safety, always wear um, temperature resistant gloves. So those tubes that I'm showing here in this picture, they, 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 they should be able to last around 1,000 samples of uh, use for the combustion tube, okay? But for the reduction tube, and the, uh, you need to, um, to look at the, the filling around after after you do around 210 samples. For the post-combustion tube that is not shown in the picture, it also lasts, is the one that lasts longer, like around 2,000 samples. So you see, with, with this type of instrument, you have to constantly do some, some kind of maintenance, at least with the, with the tubes. Um, again, ask, just try to refill the tubes only with the materials specified by the manufacturer. Okay. Um, other important checks in here are the leak tests. Okay. And also regular checks on the blank uh, for the blank value determination. Those are, but this is, I mean, how to do them? 
this is this is specified usually in the manual of the of the instrument, and it might vary between instrument and instrument. So yeah, now I will jump into the atomic absorption spectrometers. Um, I like this spectrum. I like this type of spectrometers a lot. I think that uh, because they, you can analyze a lot of stuff with this. I'm going to focus today only on the flame atomic absorption spectrometers because I think that they are the ones that are more, let's say, more common in in laborat in soil labs. Um, so <clears throat> when we talk about atomic absorption or AAS uh, spectroscopy, um, we talk about mainly ion exchange or extractable cation determination. So if we, if we need to, to, to have a really good, uh, accurate determination of, of um, exchangeable bases like, like uh, calcium, exchangeable calcium, exchangeable magnesium, potassium, and, and, and perhaps sodium as well, then we need to, we, we need to consider this type of, um, of spectrometers. Um, so this means that this type of analysis is really important for um, fertility analysis. So we can also look at uh, um, exchangeable acidity. We can also look at um, iron and manganese with this instrument, uh, arsenic, selenium, and in general, heavy metals. So we, as I said before, we can we can we can use this 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 type of instrument to analyze a very wide range of um, of elements in the soil. So everything which is highlighted in I don't know what this color is to be honest, but everything which is highlighted in, oh, let's say let's put it this way everything which is highlighted in blue is undetectable, and everything which is like red or um, pink is detectable by the by the by this atomic absorption spectrometer. So you see, you have a lot of, um, let's say, a lot of uh, possibilities with this type of um, spectrometers in your lab. So how, how does it operate? So there, there, there are two, let's say, two main steps. So the first step is the sample preparation that it might be a little bit uh, cumbersome. Okay, because basically, imagine you have a, a, a soil sample. What you have to do is to, if you want to analyze, I don't know, exchangeable calcium, Okay, let's just take the example of exchangeable calcium. So what you have to do is to take your sample, try to extract all the exchangeable calcium from your soil sample. You have to do follow some standard operator procedures. And then once the, 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 you have your calcium in a solution, then this is the point in which you need to use the atomic absorption spectrometer. So um, if you look at this slide, this pink solution, imagine that this pink solution is the solution in which you have all the calcium that you want to analyze from that sample we were talking about before. So <clears throat> the sample is transported into this mixing chamber, okay, where you basically mix this fu a fuel gas with an oxidizing gas, and then boom, the, you burn the sample again, and then the sample is basically is um is go is gone here to the flame to this flame, okay. And in this flame, all these components of the sample are there, okay. And then you what you do is that you use a lamp to illuminate that flame, and <clears throat> based on the composition of the of of the atoms in that flame. Some energy will be absorbed by those atoms, and some energy will be um, the energy that it is not absorbed. It will be uh, transmitted. <clears throat> so you have a detector that detects the amount of light transmitted by the sample, and then you can, if you if you already know about how much how much of the light is transmitted, you can infer how much of the light was absorbed by the sample, and based on that absorption you can infer how much and what, yeah, how much um, uh, of a specific element you have in that original solution that you presented to the system, okay? 
One thing that it is actually worth to mention here is that, or I'd say one of the one one of the things that makes this uh, technology a little bit um, cumbersome, or well, not cumbersome, is that that the, this lamp that you see here at the top left corner is a lamp that basically it varies from element to element. So if you are analyzing calcium, you need to use a lamp that is specifically designed to determine calcium. If you are analyzing, if, you, if your goal is to analyze um, aluminum, then you have to have a lamp that it is specifically designed for, um, for aluminum, okay? Uh, but we will go back into that uh, later on in, in, the, in the following slides. Um, <clears throat> one thing, yeah, okay. Um, the flame, uh, the flame that you, that you produce here is usually mm, produced, let's say, with a, with a fuel gas and an oxidizing gas, as I mentioned before. And the, the oxidizing gas is, uh, so you can, okay, it operates usually with air, nitrous oxide or acetylene. So never use any other gas unless it, the, the, the manufacturer specifies what else to use. Okay, okay. <clears throat> okay, I, I will go back a little bit to the detector, to the detection, how it, how it works and how it relates to the standards that you have to use. As I said before, um, the, what, what the detector does is that it captures and converts the, uh, or let's say, tells you about how much um, energy or light was absorbed by the atoms in that flame. And the more absorbance, the more, the, the higher the concentration of the element that you are trying to look at is. Okay, the lower the absorbance, then the lower the concentration of that, of that element. And this absorbance happens for every element in a specific wavelength. For example, if we were talking about calcium before, so it means that you have to, or the detector will look at the wavelength uh, to uh, 422 nanometers of wavelength, yeah. And then it will look at the, it, it, it will see that there is a peak like this, or a peak like this, or, a, or like this, or like this, depending on the amount of calcium that you have in your sample. Okay, and now, what is the role that the, 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 the calibration standards plays in all this? Okay, so basically what you have to do, and I will show that uh, again a little bit later, is that um, you have to measure um, materials or solutions for which you already know and um, you have a certified value of calcium, for example. And then you can correlate the absorption to the calcium uh, amount or content. And then uh, the system inside, it will help you to build a calibration curve. And you have to do that for every single component that you have to, that you want to analyze. And yeah, that allows you to, to also your, 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 your device to analyze. Um, during the installation, it is also really important to look at, the, at those um, hoses here. So you have to connect your system to an, uh, to an oxidizing gas. You need to also connect it to a a, a, a supplier of, of fuel gas, and you also have to look at the condensates, uh, the hose for the condensates. So um, oxidizing gas and fuel gas. So I, I said before that you can use um, nitrous oxide or an acetylene, okay? For, uh, um, nitrous oxide, I think that is really, really special, basically. If you notice, <laughs> if you notice that um, you are experiencing some uh, euphoric during the during the operation of the um, euphoria during the operation of the instrument, then be careful because this gas 
this is exactly what it does. It causes um, uh, a, a feeling of euphoria. This is the, the nitrous oxide is also known as the laughing gas. So if you start enjoying too much your um, your analysis, then be careful with that because this is supposed to be boring. So careful with that. <laughs> Check those hoses and yeah, make sure that they are always very very well connected. Also the condensates. This is really important because the condensates can also be a source of explosions. Um, yeah, this is basically what I'm saying here in this slide. The, um, they are they need to be correctly plugged, especially this one. This one is really really important to to look at. Okay, so if you plan to do all the maintenance by yourself, it is highly recommended to attend training courses provided by the supplier. I wanted to 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 bring again or to highlight the attention or, the, or to yeah, to raise awareness of this thing yeah. because. There have, there have been explosions or reports of explosions already in labs due to the, to, to, to the eye here. No, 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 no. So pay, pay special attention to that. Here, there is a report of an accident that happens in the US with, the, with this instrument, with the atomic absorption instrument. And then it, um, two people re resulted um, with injuries like severe injuries. I'm not gonna talk about this special case, but it's just to, to highlight the importance of checking the houses. <laughs> so, <clears throat> going back to the using and, uh, and, oh, and the payment, so we have, we have defined some, some, some yeah. things that we consider. So we have to consider yeah, the yeah. burner optimization we have to consider the method, the method parameters. This is about the, the calibration of your instrument. Uh, we need to talk about the quality of the calibration standards, a proper keeping, and the cleanness. So let's start with the lamp and burner optimization. So all the lamps that I show you before, all the, uh, or, or the lamp that I show you before, you need to optimize the position. So because you know we are talking about lamps that emit light. And a, specific, and a very specific wavelength. So you need to be careful on how to place those lamps inside the, um, the spectrometer. So, but, but you, I mean, usually in, 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 in the, the devices, they come with software that help you to, to align those lamps properly. Okay, it is really important, but you have to keep an eye on those as well. So whenever you run your instrument, make sure that the lamps are correctly, uh, correctly aligned, otherwise, your detection uh, limits will drop. Uh, sorry, your detection limits will will be kind of messy. Um, also for the burner, so the the, the way in which the, um, the 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 liquid or like the the, the, or the samples are burned is um is really important to check. Okay, so <clears throat> um, going back again to the calibration standard solutions. He, uh, I said before also that um, usually those are not provided by the manufacturer. You have to look, to look for those standards yourself and make sure that the standards that you get are certified standards and that the provider is, is a provider that you can trust that uh, will be able to deliver you, uh, to provide you with those standards over a, let's say, um, long period of time so that you can guarantee stability in your lab for those properties that you measure with this um, atomic absorption spectrometer. Um, um, <clears throat> I also mentioned already that the calibration is done for each element. Um, the calibration is basically uh, a, an equation, a very simple equation that converts light absorbance into ion concentration. And those equations are usually linear equations that are basically yeah, it's just you fit a line, and then this equation will be uh, stored in your in your system, in your in the, your, the computer that operates the instrument, and will always uh, delivers you the the results of that specific ion you are looking at. So your accuracy and precision again depends largely on the quality of the standard. So check that standards. 
the quality of them is really important to ensure the quality of what you deliver to the users of your lab. Um, in some cases, this, um, <clears throat> the, the, the way in which you need to calibrate the instrument is not by using a, a linear equation as I'm showing here, but in some cases you have to look at um, all types of equations like uh, quadratic and so on. So, Pay, when when you when you calibrate your instrument, pay special attention to this. Okay, to 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 get a, a press, uh, this this calibration line as accurate and as precise as possible. Um, you remember that I, I I I said before that the lamp that you use depends on the on the um, on the on the ion that you are looking at. So you have to have a lamp for magnesium, you have to have a lamp for calcium, you have to have a lamp for potassium. So careful with that, you have to always, um, I mean, usually those spectrometers, they, they, they come with, um, with, with the lamp, so different lamps that you can place in, in a compartment, a lamp compartment. So it's not that it comes with one single lamp, a compartment for one single lamp. You can put, place several lamps there. And I think that if you are going to, to, let's say, to acquire an instrument, check how many lamps it is uh, you are allowed to put there so that um, at least you don't have to uh, manipulate those lamps uh, constantly in your instrument. Because the more you manipulate the lamps, then the, the less they will last. So, yeah. um, instruments, uh, as I said, you usually can allocate multiple lamps. Ideally, your instrument should be able to allocate at least the, all the lamps for all the elements that you need to measure. Mm. <clears throat> so each lamp, what is special about this lamp? So each lamp emits light at the specific wavelengths where the target element absorbs it. So if um, <clears throat> you should calibrate or align the lamps if you have installed a new lamp. So if one lamp break and then you need to replace it, then you need to recalibrate your, your instrument for that specific um, um, element that your lamp was supposed to be used for. You need to, um, uh, you need to get the, more, the best possible signal to noise ratio. Basically that this guy here, uh, this guy here, this, these signals here, they are not noisy, but they are very smooth. So if you get noise here, it's because your lamp is not properly aligned or perhaps the burner is not properly aligned, but I think that is because of the lamp is not properly aligned. So, or the lamp can be also um, dirty. Sometimes uh, dust um, keep lying on, on, like accumulating on those lamps. So you need to clean these lamps properly. But sometimes you, you manipulate the lamps, you you put basically dirt on them. So you need to make sure that the lamps are really, really clean. Okay, and <clears throat> if you're using a lamp from a different from the one recommended by the device, you also need to pay special attention to the calibration again. Um, check your instrument manual for what types of lamp you can use. Um, yeah. When manipulating the lamps, you need to hold them by the base okay, to avoid um, dirtiness on them. So it's recommended to have spare lamps. Their lifetime is about between between 1,000 and 8,000 hours. All, all, again, it also depends on the lamp manufacturer, the lamp quality, and so on. So this is not a fixed number, but it is good, good practice that you keep some spare lamps in your lab, because if one lamp breaks today, then it will block all the measurements for that specific um, element, and you never know when you are going to get uh, the lamp replaced. So this can be very problematic. So keep always a, a, um, a lamp um, and spare lamp for every, uh, for every in, uh, element in your lab. So when acquiring new lamps, check for the lifetime specifications of the provider. 
So some lamps might be cheap and might be might look like a good option, but at the end, if the if the manufacturer cannot guarantee the um, uh, a given lifetime, then you are is is highly uncertain how much they will last, and it will be very difficult for you to plan proper maintenance of your instrument. So try to get um, lamps which at least come with some lifetime specification. <clears throat> There are some also some lamps like um, that some instruments that come from with with sorry some instruments that come with lamps deuterium lamps that are used or those deuterium lamps are basically made out of hydrogen that doesn't absorb uh, that cannot be detected by the absorption atomic spectroscopy but they are used uh, to correct the background effects in the spectrum that you get from the early instrument so. Check that, check those lamps as well, because um, regularly, because they last um, less than the other ones. These ones last around 1,000 hours. So, and then it requires also just one single alignment when it is installed in that. So, <clears throat> again, as daily maintenance, um, what you can do is to check for leaks. This is really important. Remember that explosion that happens in the US. We don't want uh, you to experience the same thing, of course. Um, check the exhaust system and empty the waste. Check for the, um, the uh, NO2, N2O sorry, levels, and also for the, for the C, uh, CH levels as well. And clean, uh, the, uh, clean spray the chamber of the lamps and all, everything which is glass inside your in instrument and use distilled water for cleaning, always. We don't want any interference later on in the measurements coming from dirty water. Um, do a deep cleaning weekly of the spray chamber. So spray chambers might vary also a lot across different manufacturers. So check the, the manual for that. And again, get proper training. Check the air filters, check the gas supply hoses. Um, and yeah, this, those are like the, the basic, basic uh, recommendations of operation of your atomic absorption spectrometers. As you, has, uh, as you have seen, they are really, really useful because you can analyze a lot with them, but they also demand a lot from you, like a lot of maintenance from you, a lot of um, training, let's say, to get proper, um, proper results. So yeah, now uh, we go into the into the IR spectroscopy, which is again something really, really interesting and um, something that um, uh, labs in the futures, every lab in the future will have is going to, to talk about that. Okay, so um, uh, can, can we delete these lines? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I was suffering because I could see these green lines all the, all the time in the presentation. Um, okay, so uh, I will talk now about um, the use of IR spectroscopy for the simultaneous measurement of physical and or chemical properties of soil. Um, I'm going to introduce IR spectroscopy uh, in general. Um, so basically, uh, the technique is based on the interaction of matter and light. Uh, and it could be in the mid or in the near infrared range. These are the two techniques that we thought would be nice to talk about. Uh, but the introduction is general for both because they're both coming from the same place, let's say. So, um, so when, the, when the light and matter interact, uh, the light can be absorbed or reflected by the sample in proportion to its physical and chemical characteristics. And the technique is, use, is useful for, for estimating organic compounds, mineralogy, texture, pH. Uh, there are 
of course, differences um, between the two techniques. Um, but basically, um, the, the molecules uh, that absorb infrared light, uh, or let's say the bonds uh, between atoms that form molecules, that form matter or soil, <laughs> Um, when they are irradiated by infrared light, um, these bonds vibrate uh, and also this causes a change in the dipole momentum that um, leads to this absorption of light. Here I show you some <laughs> moving atoms. Uh, this would be an example of the movements that happen in, in molecules when they are irradiated by infrared light. Um, there are different types of movements. You can see one is moving like this, the other one is more like a scissors. We don't go into that detail, but all these things are shown uh, in the infrared spectrum. Uh, and yeah, the, um, the frequency at which the light is absorbed um, corresponds to the natural frequency of the vibration. Or said in a different and easier way, um, the frequency at which this vibration occurs is always uh, fixed for types of uh, bonds and types of vibration, which helps uh, later on, um, or which shows as a fingerprint of the molecules in, in the sample. So in this slide, I have uh, a very basic diagram of, uh, of an uh, infrared measurement. Um, the infrared devices basically uh, consist of a light source and also a means to, to select what the wavelength range, but let's say it's a light source that hits the sample, our soil sample, which is in a sample holder and um, this absorbance or reflection happens and what is reflected goes into the detector. On the right side of the slide, we have different ways in which the light interacts with matter. For example, sometimes there is reflection or there is uh, diffuse reflection, uh, which means that the light goes through the sample somehow a bit and then it's, uh, it's not specularly reflected. It's just like more diffusely or more scattered. Um, there is absorption uh, in which the light stays in the sample, let's say. Uh, there is transmission where the light goes through the sample. There is refraction, there is dispersion. But really the one that I'm going to be referring to all the talk is uh, reflectance, mainly reflection, because uh, this is what normally happens with solid samples like soil. Uh, transmission, for example, is for liquids. Um, so, I mean, if you have like a, a sample that you have diluted, you can use transmission, but normally it's reflection that we are using. So, yeah, sorry. Um, this was the way in which light interacts, but Continuing with the setup, <laughs> basic setup of a, of a spectrometer, we have the light source, the sample holder, the, di the detector, the computer, uh, which uh, is used to operate the system, and also where you can select um, how you want this measurement to happen. Also, um, the computer will collect or will represent um, the IR spectrum, uh, which is basically the, it's a plot of the absorbance against the wavelength or frequency in which you are operating. Okay, so we have the spectra, but the spectra, the, the spectrum or the spectra uh, by, them, by themselves, unless you have experience interpreting spectra, uh, it doesn't tell you much. Uh, especially in NIR, but we see that later. Um, so one of the options you have, if you have experience, etc., is to do interpretation of the spectra, which will uh, help you with identification of 
composition of mm, your soil sample. Normally what happens is that some chemometrics are involved. This means that uh, models, uh, predictive models are developed to uh, extract the information from the spectra. And it's basically, it's basically a, a correlation between spectra, absorption, and reference values. Okay, uh, reference values meaning uh, reference that are obtained with a primary technique because IR is a secondary technique. We still rely on um, primary techniques like Kieldal, for example, or others to, to get, for example, the values of nitrogen. The, the IR doesn't measure the nitrogen, it just um, measures the spectra and then from the spectra we extract this information by training a model, a predictive model, that will uh, tell us um, these values from unknown samples. But we need to always use these calibration models and they are based on reference values that we obtain from primary techniques. I don't know if that was very clearly explained, but I hope so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> until now I was talking about IR, uh, but um, we have two adjacent portions of the, of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, the mid-infrared and the near-infrared. So the mid-infrared is the portion that goes between 2,500 and 25,000 nanometers, although normally MIR is referred to in wave numbers, a uh, measure of frequency. So, which would be 4,000 to 400 um, centimeters or wave numbers. In the mid infrared spectrum is where the fundamental vibrations of these functional groups happen, what I, des what I described basically. These vibrations, etc. <clears throat> this, <coughs> sorry, this is what happens in the mid infrared, and this shows as a fingerprint in the spectrum where you can with experience interpret if you know where each component or at which frequency each um, functional group absorbs um, infrared light. And we have the NIR spectrum which is uh, the portion of the uh, of the spectrum that goes between seven, 750 approximately to 2500 nanometers. Uh, but it consists of overtones and combinations of these fundamental vibrations of the, of the mid-infrared. <coughs> Sorry. Some people describe it like um, the MIR is the drop that falls in the water and then the, the waves that are um, increasing from that central point, those are the NIR <laughs> bands. So, Whereas the, the MIR spectrum looks very defined, uh, the, the NIR spectrum is really made of broad and overlapping bands. So the, it's quite complicated to really extract visual information from the NIR um, spectrum. And for these chemometrics or calibration models um, are needed to extract the information. So, so which one do you want to do you do you choose um, of course it depends on your needs um, the yeah the mid infrared is the fundamental vibrations and the NIR is a combination band it's all more overlapping not so clear MIR you see it and what you see there is what you have I mean it's a Qualitatively, you can get the, the information from the first moment, but with an IR, you can't. Uh, MIR, for example, proves also really good for soil mineralogy identification and to identify more specific substances, just visually. <coughs> um, but NIR, for example, is great for common soil parameters like moisture, pH, carbon, nitrogen, texture. So, um, here comes some, some of the perhaps more uh, critical points, like MIR usually requires more sample processing, whereas uh, NIR 
is quite simple. Dry and sieve the sample to approximately one or two mm, millimeters, and that's it. Um, with a Maillard, it depends on your on your configuration. Well, all their ways in, involved the preparation of uh, KBR discs with a special device. This is quite uh, time consuming. So. There are no more than ways nowadays, but which are faster. But um, the thing is, MIR is more expensive than uh, NIR because the components and the spectrometer uh, inside is uh, they are made different. So MIR is made of more expensive materials, let's say. So uh, it can be more expensive. So it will always depend on which. Uh, are your needs like if you just need uh, the device for general um, common routine analysis, perhaps with an NIR you're fine. If you want to study more in detail mineralogy and, and this kind of thing or you know, pesticides or things like this that you can identify in the spectra, then MIR is probably better. And also, um, with uh, with MIR, if you want to quantify, you also need chemometrics anyway. So from that point of view, uh, there's no advantage in any of the two, but yeah, MIR is more specific. So, um, well, briefly, I show you here some configurations uh, of NIR spectrometers. Uh, we have the as we said before, we have the light source, we have the sample, the detector, but in between the light source and the sample, there is uh, usually uh, an element that will um, target the light and the wavelengths. And we have the old filter-based uh, spectrometers, which are the simplest, but uh, measures only a few determined wavelengths. So you are losing information. Uh, then we have dispersive spectrometers in which we have a dispersive element uh, and then a gap to uh, direct the, um, the sample beam. And of course, we, we can see that the, uh, the spectra is more um, complete than the, for the filter-based uh, spectrometer. Uh, yeah, sorry. And, well, one of the disadvantages of the dispersive one is the, uh, the reproducibility of wavelengths depends on, on the mechanical components inside. And also there is less intensity uh, in the light. Um, then we have the Fourier transform uh, spectrometers. Um, this is the common one for mid infrared. And that's why usually mid infrared is referred to as FTIR. Uh, but also this uh, this configuration is uh, is also possible in NIR devices. Uh, how it works? We have the light source and we have the beam divider. It divides the the beam into two uh, beams that go to a fixed mirror and a moving mirror. Okay. Um, then this comes back uh, to the beam divider and goes to the sample. The thing is that by the fact that the moving, the, one of the mirrors is, is moving, an interference happens. This is what we call the interferogram, okay? But this interferogram is then con converted into the shape of a normal spectrum uh, with uh, a mathematical transformation is called Fourier transformation. Here we have, uh, I'll leave you also a link in case you want to see this in more detail. <clears throat> the advantage of this uh, configuration is that um, you get simultaneous information of all the wavelengths at the same time. So this reduces the, the noise and also there is higher spectral resolution and also it allows a higher precision of measurements. Um, sorry, a disadvantage of this is just that um, this mechanism makes it all more expensive. 
so these moving parts. So this is what I mentioned earlier, for example, for the MIR, because they tend to be Fourier transform. So um, that makes them also, uh, it's one of the factors that make them more expensive. <clears throat> Sorry. So that's the basics of uh, what an infrared spectrometer is and different configurations. Uh, but the, yeah, the basic system is this, or what you get when you buy uh, a spectrometer is your spectrometer. And you also need a computer. Okay? Normally the computers is, are one of these peripherals that we mentioned earlier. That, they don't come with the uh, device. So um, to install the, the, the spectrometer is simple. Connect the, <coughs> the device to the computer uh, through Ethernet cable, connect to the, um, to the mains, electricity, switch on device, switch on PC, and connect the two of them between, um, sorry, connect between uh, device and computer uh, and use the, um, the necessary software uh, that should also be provided with the, with the device. Um, the good thing about N, uh, well, NIR or uh, MIR is that there are no chemicals involved. Um, so, you don't really need film cupboards or like uh, protective uh, uh, equipment or personal equipment, etc. Um, you need to, however, have of course the proper space uh, and have some surrounding space uh, to place your sample, to play a comp computer, etc. And I mean, common sense, just to have a, a clean, stable, and horizontal base. Sometimes uh, you can um, install install the device in a trolley because you need to move it within your lab. Uh, but in that case, just have to make sure that this trolley is um, stable, is strong, and also mm, that there is not a lot of vibration. Uh, I mean that, yeah, uh, I guess you're not going to be using it <laughs> while moving the, the trolley, but yeah, just prevent also vibration. Um, again, instruments are heavy, so make sure that you move it between two people. Here we come to one of the key uh, issues with, um, with IR devices. Uh, temperature and humidity uh, affect uh, measurements because uh, especially humidity, uh, water is strongly absorbed absorbed by IR. So these temperature and humidity variations uh, really affect measurements. And here I show you um, a graph, uh, some from some data collected over years, and you can easily see the seasonal variation in some measurements. They are um, measurements of of two. Uh, peaks, uh, two particular peaks, and the yellow line indicates where the peak measurement should be, <laughs> and you see that the temperature and uh, humidity that are associated with seasonal uh, changes throughout the year, it shows in this spectrum. So, this is something really, really important uh, to take into account when working with IR devices. How is this addressed? By installing the devices in a controlled laboratory environment, uh, uh, in a laboratory with controlled environment. We suggest uh, temperatures between 18 to 35 degrees. Uh, humidity should not exceed 30%. <coughs> And as I mentioned before, uh, if, if it's possible, avoid vibration, which could affect the, the inside moving parts and also uh, keep it clean because dust, etc., it can get in, in the, um, between like the, um, the sampling window and the sample. So you would be adding error to your measurement. 
Mm. Also for FTIR or mid infrared, um, it's important uh, to have a supply of dust free perch gas to perch the system internally uh, to eliminate water and carbon dioxide, which uh, cause noise in the spectrum. So it would be necessary to have a pipe for dry air uh, in your lab if you are installing a, a mid-infrared or FTIR device. Um, well, some additional recommendations, something that we have already mentioned, follow the manufacturer indications. And um, yeah, another mm, detail <laughs> to mention, is that usually the scanning mechanisms are locked for transportation. So sometimes you install the device and it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but it's just, just locked. You just need to unlock it. Normally, as we suggested, you will get the, you will get the device installed by a specialist of the company. So this person should take into account this. But uh, yeah, we mention it anyway, because this is something that has happened to us. So just to mention it. And yeah, well, apart from installing and connecting to the computer, normally it's necessary to, to carry out some uh, calibration and performance uh, tests uh, before operation. Uh, now, mentioning briefly uh, how to use the devices, well, um, again, it's a simple, simple thing. Uh, you calibrate the baseline uh, using an external reference. It's a reflectance standard. I mentioned it a bit later. You put your sample. This you don't need to do it every measurement. Like you do that, for example, at the in the morning before you start your routine operation, and and that should be it. Um, then you put your sample in your sample container. It could be a petri dish. It depends on on the device, on the manufacturer, etc. But yeah. Recommend we recommend you use the or you follow the user guide. Uh, I ha I have already mentioned I think uh, that the sample should be previously dried and homogenized uh, to to remove effects of particle size, which also affect the the absorption features. And and well, soil is a very variable matrix, so you want to homogenize it. Uh, as much as possible for this analysis. Uh, well, once you have your sample in your container, collect the spectra, uh, you just press click, and then these measurements tend to take uh, maybe less than a minute, half a, half a minute or something like this. With your spectra, which you can do what I mentioned earlier, you can interpret the spectral features using a library, or if you have experience enough, uh, just visually, you can identify uh, components of the sample, or uh, you have obtain your estimates, uh, estimates uh, thanks to the calibrations that are implemented in the device. Uh, normally, you acquire the device with these calibrations already, or you could as well um, develop them yourselves for which you need to measure spectra and measure uh, using a reference technique, uh, whatever property of interest, but of the same samples. And then, uh, yeah, the calibration uh, will make a correlation between those two pieces of information and then you develop your model. I know I'm not explaining in very much detail, but uh, I'm happy to explain in detail at some point if you need. Anyway, once you have collected your spectra, uh, you clean your sample container and then uh, sampling window a bit and then pass on to the next measurement. The especially NIR is quite a throughput technique so you can measure many samples in one day, um, up to 100 samples perhaps. And um, the, the thing is, uh, these calibrations, you can have calibrations for as many parameters as you want, let's say, of the, I mean, of the ones that are possible, of course, but so whenever you measure a sample and you have your calibrations already in the, in the computer, you will get estimates instant, simultaneously for all these parameters 
with just one measurement. So that's that's a good thing of these uh, techniques that you get a lot of information in just one uh, one measurement. So basically, you combine all of the other techniques into one. So um, I measure, I mentioned like the first step to use the device is to measure and calibrate your device with an external reference, uh, which are usually I show. Uh, an image uh, here. Um, they are normally made of uh, standard material like PMMA or Spectralon. They are um, they are reflectance standard. Normally they are 90% reflectance. So we use this to calibrate the reflectance baseline. And frequent measurements of this um, reference can may compensate for environmental effects and the aging of the internal uh, lamp uh, which could uh, influence the spectra. Mm. Oh, uh, what was I going to say? <laughs> I lost it. <laughs> so um, the external references are one of our main uh, problems <laughs> because it's, it's one, of, of one of the key things that need to be taken into account for maintenance uh, for, for these devices. Um, here at the bottom, I show a, a spectra, uh, sorry, um, a picture of a, of a wet reference that we found uh, at a user in a lab uh, and it was completely dirty. So of course you cannot calibrate your, your device, the reflectance baseline with, with a white surface that is dirty. So it's really, really important to keep the external reference clean and undamaged. Um, so, don't, I mean, recommendations, don't drop it, don't scratch it, don't use uh, cleaning products that are really abrasive or like a, you know, like a sponge or something like this, that scratch the surface because this affects the, the reflectance. Um, yeah, I mean, some people use compressed air, uh, but it's not so recommended because sometimes it's, you know, it's not so clean. Uh, we recommend that it, these uh, references are clean with pure acetone. Um, and of course, don't use them if they are damaged or scratched. And yeah, the, the image on the top, it's very common to touch them <laughs> with the finger and we have wax and fat, fat in our skin. So we leave the fingerprint of, of our hand and this absorbs uh, infrared light. So, so the, surface ha the surface has to be clean. The maintenance of IR devices is also not complicated. Uh, regularly, uh, normally it's automated, but you can do it manually, uh, carry out performance tests uh, just to check uh, Things like the linearity, the wavelength stability, the proper work or working of the interferometer, the, the laser, etc. Uh, then signal to noise ratio, and of course the the main maintenance you can do to the device is to operate it carefully. Uh, there are, especially in the mid infrared FTIR devices, there are um, delicate components. Uh, for example, the, the windows are fragile because they are, they are uh, made of salts and they are highly hygroscopic. So that's one of the reasons why the, the environment of the lab should be as dry as possible, or if you have spare parts, you need to store them in dry conditions. And of course, you cannot just clean with water because they are salts, so you can damage uh, the, the surface uh, and make it um, opaque to IR uh, light. So of course, again, follow the manufacturer uh, guidelines, but um, these are things that um, we have also experienced. So that's why we are giving you this recommendation. Um, yeah, also, yeah, cleaning, I already mentioned, um, 
use dry, like for the external surfaces, uh, use a dry cloth uh, or <clears throat> optical surfaces, use op optical tissue and uh, the cleaning of the external reference I have already mentioned. And of course, never open it, never open the spectrometer to clean it inside. Uh, <laughs> sometimes you can see like a bit of dust there, but yeah, no, don't open it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's also, we have already mentioned, it's important to always have uh, spare, part, spare parts in stock. Uh, things that you could replace in an AR uh, spectrometer, something that the, the user can do by him or herself uh, is to replace the lamp module, the laser unit, which is, uh, this is only for FT devices. Um, filters, uh, the, the lamp, um, desiccant cartridges, if there is anything. Uh, Leo has already mentioned, like, if you are dealing with lamps, you cannot touch the, the main surface, just take them by, by the base as well. So really, maintenance is, uh, is relatively easy, and perhaps uh, yearly you want to have your service technician coming to check for for the stability of the like the linearity the wavelength stability etc but I mean these are things that you can <coughs> check regularly um, so till here my <laughs> talk about IR um, devices we conclude with very brief uh, messages yeah um... So I was I was looking at the <clears throat> at the questions that we had in the chat, and a lot of those questions were uh, some of them at least they were related to to specific vendors. So um, yeah, in, so, in some cases the the operation of the instrument might vary. Well, in basically most of the cases, is the operation and maintenance of the instruments might vary from vendor to vendor. So it's difficult to, to have a, one single unique global recommendation for the operation of one instrument type. So therefore, please always check the, the manuals because this is really important. Follow the recommendations that are in the manuals and talk about the, um, and ask also for proper support from the vendor. So is your right. So if you buy an instrument, which is all, of course, uh, not always uh, cheap, uh, you have the right, I mean, you have, if you have an investment, you have the right to ask for proper support. So it's not about only buying the instrument and place it in your lab and that's it. So I think that um, is, is good that you can uh, verify that you can build a kind of a relationship with, uh, between you and the provider so that you can have proper support because if you buy an instrument and then no support is behind that instrument, then if your instrument breaks at some point or you have a problem with that, then it would make it would make it uh, unusable in some cases. So um, make sure that you um, <clears throat> claim your right to get proper proper and, and high level support. Let's say. So <clears throat> this is really important. Um, those are basically um, the recommendations that we have for you today. Um, <clears throat> I was also, I wanted to say, to mention that, of course, our background, as we mentioned at the beginning, is not in, I mean, it's not, it's, it's basically NIR spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy and soil science. And we are not experts in perhaps in every detail of the instruments that we show you today, but we will be happy to help you with any questions you have regarding those instruments. We know people that are really like uh, super experts in, in, in every of uh, those instruments that we show today. So we can come to them, ask them for support so that we can answer the questions that, uh, that, that you might have today. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you. Many, many thanks, Leonardo and Stefania. I think it was very useful. 
I'm asking one more to participants if they have any question that has not been answered already. Uh, maybe there is just uh, one that arrived now about uh, near and near, if uh, they are suitable for analysis of which soil nutrients for fertility evaluation. Yeah, this is a, <coughs> a tricky question <laughs> because yeah, it depends a lot on the um, on the on the type of soil. I mean, the message that we want to deliver today about the the NIR spectrometers is that they don't actually they don't replace one-to-one -one the conventional soil analysis but we think that this technology can be used to uh, and be coupled to the conventional soil analysis to 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 improve the throughput of your conventional analysis so i think that it depends on the uh, in terms of fertility in the, it depends on the on the on the properties you are looking at usually when it comes to fertility perhaps it's better to 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 use IR spectroscopy, if you want to look at the exchangeable cations, for example, or ions. So it's better to use a mid infrared spectroscopy. When, in my experience, I can also say that um, <clears throat> for, for um, uh, particle size um, determination is really good. I mean, both NIR and IR spectroscopy. So you can couple both of them, and uh, oh, sorry, you can use both of them to to help you to to uh, to improve your conventional analysis. We also have a question from Turkey for CNO analyzer. Is it necessary to have or sign an annually maintenance service when we obtain good results for calibration standards to check the quality control of the analysis, especially from the point of ISO? IEC 17.025 standard requirements? Well, <clears throat> I think that is a very broad question. I think that if you already have in place in your lab your uh, own quality checks, and if you, if let's say, if, you if your lab is already certified, then I think that it is, I mean, it would be enough from my point of view, but this is a very personal point of view. I, th I think perhaps someone in the, in the, in the chat might disagree. But if that is the case, then I don't think that it is really like um, mandatory that you have to uh, sign a service contract with the, with the vendor. And, yeah. Uh, there is a question from Tenbin Kozi. So Tenbin Kozi, please unmute yourself. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, Hello. I want to ask the, if we have the attenuated the reflectance the IR instrument and also a diffuse the reflectance IR instrument. Is there a significant difference if you are to use any one of the, the two? I, I think we couldn't hear you very well, but I think what you asked us is that if using an ATR accessory for mid infrared, if there is any difference in using mid or near infrared, is that what you meant? The, the attenuated the more attenuated total <laughs> reflectance, I think. Yeah, and also the diffuse. In terms of sample preparation, you mean you mean I guess. Uh, in terms of reading the samples for soil yeah. parameters. Yeah, you're right. Uh, using the um, attenuated total reflectance accessories for the mid infrared. Uh, you don't really need more sample processing than for NIR. They only, I mean, you, you use, again, you use the dry and milled sample. Um, but the, normally the, the sampling window in the ATR accessory is very small. So you are reducing a lot the um, area or the surface that you are sampling in your soil. So you are not perhaps capturing so much the variability. In that case, perhaps you need to do more subsampling to try and capture more the variability of the soil. But, but you are right uh, in terms of sample preparation, etc., cetera, is the same uh, as for NIR. Thank you. 
There are some other two questions for you guys. So do you also make CNS analyzers? Um, no, no, we don't manufacture the, that anymore. We, in the past, we had um, some <clears throat> collaboration with a company in Germany, but we don't manufacture a CHM analysis at the moment. Yeah. And you have a lot to, maybe it was better if you took my offer this morning to start presenting already. <laughs> there are other questions for you. So <laughs> do Buki already have a set of library of organic fertilizer that can estimate the amount of nutrients? No, we don't. No, no, we, don't. no we don't. There are, uh, there are libraries for pharmaceutical products, but we don't have for, for uh, um, fertilizers. No. Yeah. And the other question about mass and particle size for Duma combustion. Uh, I think it's up to one gram that you, that you can measure uh, with this method uh, in these capsules. Mm -hmm. And I think the particle size is one millimeter, I believe. But definitely it's just one gram maximum. Yes, which is, uh, yeah, one of the, is one of the things that uh, Although Duma is quite convenient, it's much easier, let's say, than Kjeldal, that Kjeldal has a lot more chemicals, etc. But Kjeldal allows for higher amounts of sample to be analyzed. So a, again, is with more sample, you may capture more information than, for example, Kjeldal, I think is up to 10 grams of sample, whereas Duma is one gram. So yeah, you have uh, less less information. And it's the same as for the NIR or MIR with this ATR accessory, because the sampling window is smaller, then uh, you have less representation of your of your soil sample. I don't know if that answered. Thank you uh, very much. Yeah, they, they thank you indeed. Um, well, there is a remark, I think. It's need a good representative of samples for CNS. Yes. Okay. <laughs> How is harmonization achieved when instruments vary from vendor to vendor? I think that the harmonization is <clears throat> something that also depends a lot on the, on the, materi on the reference materials. So... <laughs> Uh, as long as you can get for the same ref for the same reference material the same uh, results, then you are in the safe side. No, so I mean all, all the instruments as, as as we as we have seen, all the instruments they don't directly measure the 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 the, the, <clears throat> the, the element. What they measure is something else that correlates very well with the element. So. I think that uh, there are many principles of measurements, many types of instruments, many setups. So it's really, I mean, you will always have this variability. It's really difficult to, to get rid of this variability from vendor to vendor. Even within vendor, you, you might have some variability as well. So the important thing, as I said, uh, in, as I repeated constantly during the, during the presentation is to have a, a really good set of calibration standards to ensure that your results at the end are really comparable, perhaps uh, across different laboratories. This is actually one of the main points that we will address through our initiative on spectroscopy. So how to harmonize all data and information also coming from different instruments. So maybe we can give you a better answer than Vincosi in uh, the coming years by working all together because uh, Leonardo and colleagues are also part of the working group on, on spectroscopy. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, maybe we take a last uh, question, if you're fine. Uh, what's the minimum number of samples required in calibrating the near or near against the conventional methods? Yeah. <clears throat> well, the point is that um, it depends as well. <laughs> there is not really like uh, uh, precise answers in, the, in this regard, but um, <clears throat> So for example, in my experience, let's say the way in which we use 
in AR spectroscopy or we, that we have seen that it can be used in AR spectroscopy. Uh, where, where we, when we have seen that it can be operational is that, for example, if you go to a farm and you need to assess the, I don't know, uh, texture, then <clears throat> what you do is that, yeah, you, you take some samples of this farm to calibrate your, your models, but your models will be specifically the, for that farm. They will not, you will not be able to extrapolate. And usually, for example, my experience in Brazil was that um, with around 100 to 150 samples are enough for uh, an area of 500 hectares. So yeah, around 100 samples are, are, might be enough for, for calibrating those models for this, this big, big area. But of course, the bigger the area, it might be, the, the depends on the parameters, of course, and also the bigger the area, the, the, the more samples you might need. And this is one of the, the, the challenging also questions that we, are, that we might um, try to solve in, in the context of the project of the, of the soil spectroscopy project. Yeah. Not, not sure if uh, you see <clears throat> this last question, it, but I don't know if it's a question. Depend on the diverse of samples, more diverse and need more samples. Do you understand? Yeah, I think that, yeah, yeah. I think that uh, yeah, this is more a, a, a remark. And I agree with that remark. Basically, what it, in, in other words, in other words, is that. Uh, the larger the diversity of your area, the, the larger the number of the samples that you might need to calibrate models for that specific area. Perfect. Um, I hope that um, you're all happy. Is there any other question or remark just before we close the meeting? If not, well, I read a lot of uh, expression of appreciation toward uh, Leonardo and Stefania. So thank you very much. Uh, I think this was a, a very super training session as they define it. So <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, really very much, much yeah. thanks to you. Uh, and thank you also to all participants that stood with us till the end of uh, today. And we are looking forward to see you tomorrow. So thank you very much and see you tomorrow. Bye, you. take Bye. care. Bye. Bye.